Please relax. We can talk and eat. No problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How many students do you have? We have. Uh, usually, you see the aerospace uh, enrollment. Maybe the biggest is Georgia Institute of Technology. Yeah. Two hundred. So we are almost half that. Yeah. One hundred. Yeah. So the campus uh, includes not only the aero department. Do you guys have an astro? We have astrodynamics included in the curriculum. Okay. Uh, for example, introduction to aerospace, which include aeronautics and astronautics. But usually, you see, aeronautics is the major part, yeah. even in MIT. Yeah. But we have astronautics. We introduce it in uh, introductory course okay. in 200 level, and also we include it in uh, propulsion. We include it also maybe in. Uh, Flight dynamics and control, yeah. and also in design project, we have some of our master uh, designing satellite. Okay, so uh, you want us to go there? We can uh, have everything here. Okay. The okay. student and the faculty waiting there. Okay. okay. Well, great. Yeah. Cool. Can we uh, pass the restroom before we start? Sure. I want you to be in your best. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our dear guests and all the uh, faculty and staff and students of the Aerospace Engineering Department uh, for this uh, meeting. Uh, let me uh, first start by uh, introducing our uh, guests. Uh, we have uh, Dr. James Riley. Uh, Dr. Riley has received uh, his BS and MS and PhD in Geosciences from University of Texas, uh, Dallas. He has a wide experience in oil and gas exploration, uh, particularly in offshore operations. He was selected by NASA for the astronauts program in 1994, where he uh, reported uh, in 1995. Uh, he is the recipient of several uh, honors and uh, awards. Uh, he has logged in his record uh, more than 850 hours in space flight. This includes more than 30 hours of uh, extra vehicle activities or spacewalks. Uh, his record includes uh, flying in the Space Transportation System, uh, STS number 89 in 1998. STS-104 in, in 2001, and STS-117 in 2007. Uh, he has retired from NASA in 2008. We'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Riley. We're also glad to have uh, Mr. X. Wilhelm. Uh, he has received his B.S. Uh, in Mechanical Engineering from UCLA. He has received a Master of Science in Industrial Engineering from University of Houston in 1989. He was assigned uh, to Johnson Space Center, uh, where he was the lead engineer of the Space Shuttle Landing Gear Brakes and Runway Barrier. He has logged over 36 days uh, of space flights. These are distributed among three space flights among which he has a lot of 36 hours of extra vehicle activities. Uh, these are in five spacewalks. Uh, his record include STS-110 in 2002, STS-122 in 2008, and STS-135 ULF-7 in 2011, which was carried by Rafael 
launch vehicle. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, Dr. Cunningham as well, but uh, unfortunately he was not able to attend, so let me welcome uh, Mr. Walhan. Okay. Uh, our guests have very tight schedule, so uh, this meeting is sub supposed to end like around 10.30 because uh, Aramco uh, is taking them afterwards, so uh, we will be in a tight schedule. Uh, they're going to present like for 25 to 30 minutes each, and then we're going to have a question and answer session after uh, the talk for around 20 to 30 minutes. So please, uh, if you want to take questions, uh, ask questions, please take notes and keep questions until the end. Uh, but before I ask Dr. Uh, James to start sharing his valuable experience with us, I'd like to introduce our uh, department to our guests as well. So uh, in a few minutes, I'll just introduce the aerospace engineering department in KFUPM. Our department uh, started as an idea a long time ago, but he was officially assigned a separate department at, uh, 11 years ago. Uh, our department is in heavily involved in research. He has the highest uh, publication rate per faculty member uh, in the region. Uh, he looked, uh, we have 10 US patents in the past few years. Uh, the department is publishing uh, heavily in prestigious journals just like AIAA and other ISI uh, journals. Uh, both our programs, both the applied program and the science program, have been accredited by ABIT. And uh, ABIT has remarked that the department has benchmarked itself uh, with the top US uh, universities uh, in the field. Uh, as such, the department is involved in different uh, fields. These include the aerodynamics, gas dynamics, flight dynamics and control structures, uh, propulsion, aviation affairs, and other fields include uh, astrodynamics, with a main emphasis on the uh, uh, astro uh, aeronautics. Uh, our labs uh, include an aerodynamics lab. This includes a subsonic wind tunnel where uh, students can do experiments and faculty can do uh, research. Uh, we have a subsonic wind tunnel that has roughly one meter uh, diameter cross section. And recently, the department has acquired a new wind tunnel, a closed loop wind tunnel, uh, which uh, is expected uh, to add a valuable experimental experience to these students. Uh, our, e our labs include an airplane that was provided to the department by the Royal Saudi Air Force uh, some time ago. Uh, the department has constructed a structures uh, lab and workshop where the department has uh, built several uh, uh, remotely controlled aircraft, then went into the process of constructing uh, some aircraft and finally ended with the design and manufacture of a two-seater aircraft completely designed in KFUPM. The propulsion lab includes a self-contained jet engine lab, features a purpose-built SR30 turbojet engine. Students can see all the uh, uh, theories that they have in turbine and fluid and thermodynamics uh, right on this propulsion lab. Uh, our later lab houses an educational radar system used to conduct practical uh, training for students. We have a uh, newly acquired Unix lab that has a complete instrument flight rules IFR of Unix package. Uh, these equipment are configured and work just like in an airworthy aircraft. So students have the uh, real feel of uh, aircraft of Unix. Our uh, instrument training lab uh, includes an operational instrument panel with fully operational systems. Uh, in addition to that, the department has acquired a ball and beam uh, apart of just to illustrate the students how to control an unstable system. We also have a computer lab where students are provided with the uh, up-to-date software that can help them solve their uh, engineering and numerical problems. So with this brief introduction of uh, the faculty, the students, and our labs, I'm leaving the floor for uh, Dr. Riley uh, to start and share his valuable experience. 
And then um, Mr. Uh, Wilhelm is going to provide us uh, with uh, his valuable experience. And again, I remind you, due to the tight schedule, please let's try to keep the questions until the very end. Thank you. Okay, I think we're uh, ready to start, and uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, uh, as, you, as you heard, my name is uh, Rex Walheim. I'm an uh, active astronaut with NASA, and uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Riley and I wanted to do today was just kind of share with you a little bit about our space program and how it works. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe a typical space shuttle mission, which was my last mission, and talk about how we did that. And uh, Jim's going to concentrate more on, uh, on what we can do in the future. And uh, I think it'll give you a good appreciation for where we are, where we've been, and, and, and where we are going. And uh, our presentations are, are fairly short, so you'll have uh, plenty of time for questions, too. So uh, with that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my last space shuttle mission. This was STS-135 on uh, July 8th through 21st of last year. This was the final mission of the space shuttle program. And our job was to uh, take supplies up to the space station because we were going to be the last uh, flight up there and, and bring many thousands of pounds of supplies, food, experiments, water, everything to the space station that needed to survive for, uh, for quite some time. This is our crew here. This is the, the uh, four of us. We had a small space shuttle crew. Usually you can carry up to seven people on the space shuttle. But uh, since we were the last mission, there was no uh, space shuttle to come rescue us if we had a problem. And so we would have to come back via the Russian spacecraft, and that would take a long time because they only fit three people on there. And so to, to keep that option open, we, we decided to have a small crew of just, uh, of just four of us. Uh, part of our training is done, uh, a lot of our training is done in simulators. And this is a simulator that uh, shows how we uh, dock with the International Space Station. So we, are, we have an uh, a, uh, instructor station and a crew station there at the bottom. And we have a big dome with a virtual reality uh, display that shows the space station. And we practice docking with the space station that way. Um, the, uh, the, the space shuttle when we docked with the space station was all done manually. And so the, the pilots had to fly manually the, uh, the docking with the space station. We also had to do our uh, spacewalk training. I was the lead spacewalker on this flight. Um, on this last flight, I didn't do any spacewalks, but I had done five before. But even though I wasn't planned to do a spacewalk on my final mission, we had to train as if we were going to do one because we never know if something went wrong with the space shuttle or something happened that we would have to, uh, um, we would have to go out and, and repair that. So we have a big facility in, in Houston. It's called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. And what it is, it's a, a big pool, basically. And on the, on the bottom of the pool is a big mock-up of the space shuttle and the space station. And so this is a picture of, uh, of me doing one of the practice runs. You can see the scuba divers around me, and uh, that's me upside down on the left there. And uh, so we're practicing our tasks underwater. Now you'll notice this, uh, this laboratory doesn't look too high fidelity. It's got, uh, you know, it's plastic objects and stuff. But what's important in the neutral buoyancy lab is the dimensions. Dimensionally, everything is almost perfect underwater. So if there's a handrail in the pool, there's a handrail in space. And so you practice over and over in the pool to do your spacewalk so that when you get out there, everything is just like you'd planned and you know exactly where to go. It's, it's kind of like muscle memory where you, when you play the piano or play an instrument, you, you know what to do without thinking about it. And if we practice these spacewalks enough in the pool, when we get out in space when it's for real, it, it feels just like, uh, just like in the pool. And we practice each spacewalk anywhere between maybe five to ten times, over and over. And we can spend about six hours underwater uh, for, uh, for each spacewalk task. We can pretty much do the whole, the whole spacewalk all the way from end to end, and it's a great practicing tool. We also have our motion simulator, which you see behind us. And uh, we can go in there either with our suits on or with, our, with just uh, like, uh, like Dr. Riley's wearing his uh, flight suit. We can go in there and practice our launch and our landing. And you can see it's a motion simulator. It's got the, it, it can move in, in all axes. And uh, it, it, we train a whole lot in there. And this day we were practicing with our launch and entry suits on. And the reason we do that is because it's harder to reach the switches and the controls with our launch and entry suit on. So we want to make sure it's very realistic. And you'll notice there's a lot of cameras around. Since we were the last space shuttle flight, there was a lot of media attention, and so we were, uh, uh, we were getting a lot of attention from the, from the folks. 
see. This is a, a picture of uh, down at the Kennedy Space Center as they're rolling out the, uh, the, the, the vehicle out to the launch pad. We, we have a big, large assembly building where we put the pieces of the space shuttle together. You can see the, uh, extra, the uh, solid rocket boosters on the side there and the external tank. And uh, they uh, put it all together here in the vehicle assembly building and they roll it out to the launch pad. Can we dim the lights a little bit? You might be able to see that a little bit better if we uh, dim the lights in the front, if someone can. Um, so uh, it's all put together and they roll it out to the launch pad uh, very slowly. You can see here it's, uh, it's being rolled out to the launch pad at night. We usually do this at night because uh, the winds are usually lower. We, got, we have limits on, uh, on the wind that we can have when we're, when we're doing this. But it's a beautiful sight to see the, uh, to see the space shuttle uh, rolled out to the launch pad. And generally the crews will sometimes come down there when we, when we do roll it out like that and have a chance to ride on the crawler. It's, a, it's basically like a big tractor that rolls all the way out from this building about three miles out to the, uh, out to the launch pad. I have a little time lapse uh, I can show you of how, this, uh, of how this works. So they take the space shuttle there and they lift it up. And take it up to the transfer aisle and, uh, and attach it to the uh, attach the external tank. There you go. That's my, that's better. You can keep it down like that. That's fine. Yeah, you can turn the lights off. That was fine with the lights off. Yeah. There you go. And see, now it uh, rolls out to the launch pad. And uh, I apologize, my video is running a little bit slow, but. Uh, uh, like I said, we have a chance to go out there. It goes about one, about uh, you know, two, uh, about one and a half kilometers per hour. So it's very slow. And then they bring the payload out. Our payload is in this transport. That's our that's our logistics module. So it's got it's basically our uh, the trunk or the the cargo carrier. So the cargo carrier goes uh, out to the launch pad, and they hoist it up and they rotate the structure back against the shuttle, and then they open up the payload base and put the cargo in. So here you're seeing the cargo being lifted up into the uh, into the launch pad, and then they will uh, will install it. Now uh, you never know what day you're going to launch in the space program. They may have a uh, scheduled launch day, but you never know for sure if that's going to be the actual launch day because of weather or mechanical problems. And here you can see the weather on the launch day that we had was uh, was pretty bad at the start. It looked like we weren't going to launch. There was a there was only a 30% chance that we would launch. And so we thought, well, this may not actually happen that day. But uh, uh, fortunately, as you can see here it's in the time lapse, at the very end, the, uh, the weather cleared out enough so that we could, uh, we could actually launch. And uh, this is the time lapse. I'll show you a little video later of uh, a little bit better picture. But you can see uh, it, uh, it ended up being a uh, good day. But uh, going back a little bit, uh, before, we, uh, before we launch, the, uh, we come down about three days before launch. And uh, the, the day we got down to Kennedy Space Center just happened to be the 4th of July, which is our nation's birthday. And so we came down there and, uh, and we pre continued to prepare for launch. And as you can see, there was a lot of people, there was almost a million people that came out to, to watch the, the final space shuttle launch. And so about three hours before launch, you get into uh, your, your launch and entry suits, your orange suits, and you go out in this van here called the Astro Van, and it takes you out about a 12 miles uh, drive out to the launch pad. And at first you see a lot of people around you and they're all waving and saying hello and it's really a neat experience. And then you get within about four and a half kilometers from the launch pad and all of a sudden there's no more people anymore. Everybody's going that way and you're going toward the launch pad. And it might make you think, uh, is this such a good idea? <laughs> and, uh, but it's, uh, you get out to the launch pad and it's an absolutely uh, a beautiful sight. You look at the uh, space shuttle, and then you take an elevator up to the uh, top floor, and this is on the launch pad. And these folks in white, they help us get uh, get suited up, or get basically get our parachutes on, and then climb into Atlantis. That's the door to Atlantis, uh, right behind me there. And then you sit and wait. 
You bet you're inside the uh, space shuttle for about uh, two hours or so before launch. And uh, the clock ticks down, you do communications checks, you talk to Houston, you talk to the Kennedy Space Center. And uh, everything, uh, everything seems to be going well on this day. The, the weather cleared up and so it looked like we were gonna, we were gonna be okay to launch. And what we do is about nine minutes before launch, we have a poll. We, we talk to all the controllers, the, the Mission Control Center and the Launch Control Center, talk and make sure everything is good to launch. And if the weather is good, if the range is clear, if all the systems are operating properly, they'll give you a go to come out of the T-minus nine minute hold. Now, if you come out of the T-minus nine minute hold, usually that means to you, hey, we're launching today. This is really exciting because this is gonna happen. If the weather's bad, you'll just stop right there and you'll get out and try again the next day. So it's very interesting on this, on this flight, uh, we came out of T-minus nine hold and we thought, wow, we're launching, this sounds great. And the clock ticked down and then at 31 seconds, the clock stopped. And we heard over the intercom, it said, the, the, the countdown has been, has been held due to a failure. And we're kind of looking at each other, what kind of failure? And uh, they, they started talking and they were all, you know, they, a lot of people think that the astronauts know exactly what's going on at all times and that's just not the case. Because we are strapped in and this, is, this vehicle at 31 seconds before launch is armed and ready to go. And uh, so we're trying to figure out, we're thinking, well, we're probably not going to launch today because our launch window is very small. And when, you, when you're within a, you know, a minute of launch, your launch window is probably maybe a minute or two. And so we figure, oh, we're not going to launch. But you could hear the ground personnel, the mission control people talking, and you could tell they, they kind of knew what the problem was. And uh, it turns out what the problem was, was that uh, the access arm on top of the, of the, uh, the space shuttle there, the hood that, that vents the... Uh, the gaseous oxygen hydrogen that comes off the external tank. They thought it was rotated away. Obviously we can't launch like that, the hood's on top of there. But the hood was rotated away, but their data, their telemetry, did not say that it was rotated away. So you could hear them talking and they said they could, ve they could verify it with the camera. And so what they did is they took a camera, and I'll show you a video later where they view the camera, and they verified it was out of the way, and they said, hey, we're, we're, it's out of the way, we're good to continue the count. And so they decide to pick up the count. Now when they pick up a count from 31 seconds, that does not give you a lot of time to collect your thoughts and be ready to go because it is not long before uh, T minus six seconds happens and then the main engines start. Now you see here the main engines have started, but we haven't taken off. That's because we're bolted to the launch pad. They held us, they held us in place so we do not launch unless the, the three main engines come up and the computers check them and they say these, these uh, engines are operating properly. If those three engines aren't operating properly, the computers will shut them down, and then we won't go anywhere that day. So the, uh, the computers take a look at it, and then everything looks good, and then at T minus zero, the solid rocket boosters launch, they light, and then you're going flying whether you are ready or not. And uh, it's an absolutely um, amazing ride. Those, uh, those solid rocket boosters, they burn for about two minutes, and then they come off, and they're recovered in the Atlantic Ocean. And then the... Uh, the three main engines, they burn for uh, a total of eight and a half minutes. So you go from zero to 25,000 kilometers an hour in eight and a half minutes. And so you are really getting shot off the planet. And, uh, and you can tell you are. It's an amazing amount of acceleration. Now as hard as it is on launch day for us in the, in the, in the uh, space shuttle, there's some people that have a harder day on launch. And this is my family. That's my wife and my two boys as they're watching me ride on that rocket uh, to outer space. So it is, uh, it is a, a very hard thing for, for the families to watch, but they're excited too, but it's, it's a little, little harder for, for them than it is for us. And this is what the view like. As you can see, the clouds uh, kind of cleared out enough to, for us to get off, and, uh, and we got up and, uh, and made space. Once you get to space, you can take off your orange launch and entry suit, and you can wear regular street clothes, regular uh, clothes. And you can see here, I'm a picture of me on the uh, on the flight deck of Atlantis. Now, our job was to go to the space station, as we said, the International Space Station, and and resupply it. And so here's a picture from the space station, looking back at us, and you can see our lo our logistics module in the in the tr in the cargo department there. That's got all our supplies in there, and we're approaching the space station now to dock with it. And they, right now we're over the Caribbean, which is very beautiful from space. You can see the beautiful uh, turquoise water. And this is where we're going, the International Space Station. That's a beautiful facility. It's, uh, it's the, a state-of-the-art research facility now. And uh, with, the, with the end of our flight, we have basically completed the, the construction of it. 
And it's a, a magnificent national laboratory where you can conduct research on anything from, from basic, uh, basic physics and uh, the, how the human body uh, behaves in space and also how systems behave in space and last in space. Because one of the purposes besides basic research of the space station is how do we get farther? How do we go to, you know, to the moon or to Mars and stay in space for long periods of time? If we go to the moon, or if we go to Mars, you know, it'll be potentially a, a two to three year mission. And we have to have all of our systems on our, our spacecraft to Mars have to operate properly for two to three years. When something breaks in the space station, we bring up a spare part from, from Earth. If something breaks on the way to Mars, it can, it can be a, a very bad situation. So one of the things we're looking at on the space station is how to, how to make uh, spacecraft systems, and your, especially your life support systems, operate for that amount of time. And so we're learning a great deal about, uh, about how to do that. The other thing we're, we're learning about is how the human body behaves in zero gravity and can the human body last for long periods of time in, in space and, and how do we counteract the effects of zero gravity because it's not natural on your body and we're learning that. And then the basic research we can do on the space station, everything from uh, basic material science to uh, how combustion works to how medicines work in zero gravity are all done up there. And it's about the size of, a, uh, of about a five bedroom house and, and I'll tell you, I'll show you some pictures and video later, it's a, it's a beautiful facility. So this is Sandy, one of our mission specialists. And this is inside that cargo compartment that we had on the space shuttle. And so this is all the cargo we're bringing up to the space, uh, the space station, and we're going to transfer it all to the space station. Now, uh, when you all go on a long trip in your car, and you come back, and you get to your destination, and you, you, you come back home, and you unpack your car, what does your house start to look like when your car is unpacked? Probably pretty messy, kind of like what the space station looked like when we got there. So we had our tons of supplies, and here's Doug, our, our pilot, in the space station with uh, trying to rearrange the supplies. So we didn't have a lot of time up there. We were only at the space station for about eight days. Uh, but we had to get everything unpacked very quickly. And then that logistics module, the cargo carrier, we had to fill it all up with stuff we wanted to bring to the ground. So it was, uh, it was very busy. There was also one spacewalk uh, during the mission. And uh, I, didn't, I was helping them. I didn't go outside on this spacewalk. Uh, but they were bringing a uh, failed piece of equipment on the space station home, uh, home to Earth. Uh, just to show you a little bit about how we do spacewalks, that's a picture of me on my second mission. I'm on the European module there. Now, when you're in orbit, obviously, you go around the world every 90 minutes, right? So for the first 45 minutes, it's nice and pretty like that, nice and sunshiny. It's very easy to do your job. What's going to happen in the next 45 minutes? It's going to get dark, right? And so every 45 minutes, the sun goes up or comes down. And so we have helmet lights. You can see this is a picture of my helmet lights here. So we have a small helmet light that can, that can, uh, that can light up our work area. And so I'll show you that the previous picture was out during the day, and I'll show you this similar area at night. So here's me working at night. So it, uh, it is uh, a little trickier. The, the lights light up your area of work, but it's not as easy at, at nighttime. And the first time we practice this, is basically when we experience it for the first time. In the pool where we practice our spacewalks, we never turn the lights all the way out. It's just too dangerous with divers and everything that's going on in the water. So the first time you really experience this darkness is, uh, is when you get into space. This is the crew we had all together with the space station astronauts. We had a, a Japanese astronaut, Russian astronauts, and uh, American astronauts all there working together as, a, as one big team. Of course, you got to look out the window a little bit when you're in space. There's Italy as we're going over there. This is San Francisco, California. That's where I grew up. And so uh, I like to, when you get a chance to fly over your hometown in space, it's uh, really spectacular. This is Cairo, Egypt. Now, Ky this area of the Middle East is one of the best places to look at uh, from space. And... Uh, it, it, uh, it's because it's usually clear and you can see for about a thousand miles in any direction. And if you know where to look, you can spot the pyramids from space with a little bit of a telephoto lens. So you look where Cairo, this is the city of Cairo here, that's the Nile River, and cities from space look kind of grayish. So let's zoom in a little bit with, uh, with this. And there you can see them right there, the, uh, the pyramids in Egypt. Another beautiful thing from space is the aurora. And uh, let me show you a little bit of... Uh, a time lapse here of, of what it's like to fly over the aurora. <laughs> so this is the aurora, as you can see in the. Uh, it's it's a time lapse, but it's absolutely spectacular. This is a, we had a very active aurora australis, the southern lights, when we were up there, 
And uh, that's what it looks like up there. After a week on the space station, it was time to come home. And so uh, we basically undocked from the space station, and then we turn around backwards, we fire some engines, which slows us down enough that we will start entering the Earth's atmosphere, and then we use the space shuttle like, a, like an airplane to, uh, to fly back home. Now that's a picture, this is a unique picture that wasn't, hasn't been seen very often uh, before our flight, but that's a picture from the space station of us re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And so what it looks like a comet or a meteorite at the top, that's us in the space shuttle. And so when my son, Jeffrey, saw this picture, he said, wow, it looks like a meteor. And I told Jeffrey, I'm inside that meteor. <laughs> and, so, and when you're inside that meteor, there's no question that you're in a very delicate place because the whole windows are covered in orange glow as that plasma is, is generated around you. And it is, if it's a night re-entry, you can really see it well. This last mission was my first night re-entry, and it was spectacular. And the plasma flow pulsates off the, off the tail, and it's just this fiery glow. And as beautiful as it is, you're thinking... Okay, we need to get through this at one point, and uh, you're very happy when you're when you're done getting through with it. And we land like a conventional uh, conventional airplane. Now I'll show you a little bit of a video about uh, about uh, the flight also, and then I'll I'll pass it on to to Jim, and we can uh, we can answer some questions. So each crew gets to design their mission patch, and so uh, this is our mission patch coming up here. It's a, a what we want to do, since it was the last flight, we wanted to kind of symbolize the, the space shuttle and then the, uh, the letter omega, which is there you can see is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. We wanted to signify that as the last space shuttle mission. And so uh, here's our commander, Chris Ferguson, as he's uh, heading out into Atlantis. That's our pilot, uh, Doug Hurley. And that's Sandy, Mission Specialist 1. And that's my turn as Mission Specialist 2 to, to go inside. Now here's the T-minus nine hole we told you about. It, everybody will uh, will stop and make sure everything's working properly and see how see how things are things are going. Uh, but uh, today, and they do a, a check of the engines at, toward the end there to make sure the engines gimbal the way they're supposed to and move around. And then here the clock stops at 31 seconds and everybody's going, oh no, a million people out there watching and figuring, well I guess we're not going to get to see a launch today. But then this is where they got smart, uh, and they really quickly worked just a, a really good job to take a look with this camera. They said, okay, there's the hood, and it's rotated back, so we are go for launch. So they, uh, they were able to uh, pick up the count at that point. And all the uh, press and people that were watching were very happy, and, and we were pretty excited too. And there's the count again. So at, at six seconds, the, uh, we have the, the engine start up. And what was a nice, stable building it felt like you were sitting in all of a sudden came to life. And then at T minus zero, you get an uh, incredible jolt uh, as you realize, hey, we're actually going to go flying today. Now, uh, the next picture will be from inside the space shuttle. You see the camera looking back, and, uh, and the center picture, that's me in the center, and I'm smiling away because it's a, it's a great ride. And if you like uh, roller coasters or flying, this is the, uh, the ultimate ride. And it's at two minutes, the solid rocket boosters come off. And, uh, and you can, this is a picture taken from the solid rocket boosters. And uh, then you get to orbit. And if we take out the robotic arm, this robotic arm is used to uh, pull that cargo container out of the back of the uh, space shuttle and, uh, and attach it to the space station. And this is a picture from the space station as they're looking at us as we're approaching. They're looking through the window and... Uh, and then here's a picture of us. Now my job, I'm on the right there, I'm using a, a laser gun to, to see how far away we are from the space station and uh, also how fast we're approaching it. Now before we get to the space station, we do what's, we do a, what's called a uh, rendezvous pitch maneuver. It's basically a backflip. So we're, we're flipping the space shuttle over so that the, uh, the space station crew members can use long lens cameras and check the bottom of our space shuttle to make sure there's no damage to the heat shield. It's very important that our heat shield is intact before we re-enter. And so we do that whole backflip, and then we can, uh, we can rendezvous with the uh, space station. So here's on the board the space station. That's Fergie, our commander, uh, um, coming on board, and we have a chance to say hi to everybody. And we also like to share a meal once in a while with, uh, with the whole crew. So there's me in the bottom, Sandy's kind of sitting on the wall there. And we had the space station crew members over for, uh, for dinner, and they had us over in the space station. 
And when we're up there, we're all big, one big crew. We have a Russian segment and a, and a United States segment, but we all operate together as one integrated crew. And it's a great example of international cooperation. It's, it's, we all work together, we eat together, and we solve problems together. And it's, it, it all it works out really, really well. So we had to get ready for the spacewalk. So that's me in the corner uh, behind there. And then Ron and uh, Mike are, are getting ready to go outside. And one of the first things they do is they hook up their tether because we have a, about a, I'd imagine it's uh, about uh, a 10, 15 meter tether that can, uh, can extend. And actually it's about, probably about what, uh, 20, 80 feet. So yeah, it's, it's about, about 25, 25 meters long. And so we can go, we can, we can go anywhere we want on the space station. Um, and work. But when we get to a work site, we don't just let go and work. We put a smaller tether, maybe a one meter tether, and that will allow us to stay close to our work site and we can continue to work there and, and not worry about floating off because we certainly don't want to uh, float off and hit some, uh, hit some delicate equipment. Got to have a little bit of fun when you're in space too. If you can't, uh, can't enjoy flying, you really have to do that up in space. It's a, it's a lot of fun. So here's Sandy coming in the, uh, coming in the uh, logistics module and, and start to unpack everything. And it was quite an effort. And she had some very colorful socks she liked to wear up there. And uh, there was, like I said, a uh, I think it was almost uh, 4,000 or more pounds of, of equipment that we uh, transferred back and forth. And you can see it's much easier in zero gravity than it is here. So you, you can carry stuff with your hands or just put things between your knees and, uh, and carry them on, on by yourself. And, but you can see it got uh, pretty packed in there by the time we were ready to leave. So the space station crew was happy to see us arrive, but I think after a while they're happy to see us go too because we, we made quite a mess of their house. So here is after a, after a week we, uh, we headed away on the space station. We also did some science. This was a osmosis experience that, that experiment that I was doing uh, on, uh, on the space shuttle. This is what happens to water. With the surface tension in water in space, it just sticks to your hand like that. And if you let go of a, of a, of a um, volume of water in, in the mid-deck of the space shuttle or anywhere, it'll form a perfect sphere. And it's really beautiful. It's, uh, it's uh, quite a sight to see the, a ball of water floating around there. And then we also launched a small satellite called the PicoSat. And then it was time to start getting ready to come home. So we have to put our, uh, put our launch and entry suits on again. And here you can see the plasma above me in the windows there, and that's again the picture of us re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And we uh, come down like a conventional airplane. And then we have a uh, drag chute that helps to slow us down, it reduce, reduces the wear on the brakes also. And uh, with that came the, uh, the end of the space shuttle program. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and let uh, Jim take over, and we'll be glad to answer questions after that too. So. Well, Jim is bringing up his slides. I'll be glad to answer any questions while he's bringing up his presentation. You guys have any questions? Okay, sure. Is this good? Okay, uh, questions. Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Um, okay. Let the. Uh... Yes. Just a simple question: How do you swallow your food while you're? Yes, you know it. The it, it's all interesting when you first get up there. You you, you think you know what to do because you've trained on the mission a lot, but then the day daily living activities Sorry. is a little bit challenging at first too. Because you can imagine, you, if you've, you've been in a clean room before, you know in a clean room where you have to usually wear uh, you know, covered garments and stuff, and every time before your first flight, when you've been in the space shuttle, you wear a clean garment and stuff, and so you're very careful not to damage anything, not to spill anything. So then you get to space, and it's time to eat. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I'm going to, and see, so how do you do this? So you cut open your food very carefully, and then stuff starts floating out, and you're going, oh no, I'm going to get the clean room dirty. But then finally you have to realize, okay, we have to live in this clean room, and so things are going to get, you know, float around a little bit. But you kind of get used to that, and we have fans that kind of suck the, uh, uh, the debris and stuff from your food into, into filters, and so the air stays pretty clean. But then you find out that swallowing and eating is just very similar to this down here, so it works out pretty well. And now we have, so some of our food, it brings the question about our food. 
A lot of our food is dehydrated, so we just add water to it, and then we can cut it open and eat it. Some of it's thermostabilized, so it's kind of like what, uh, um, what military people eat. And then uh, some of it's fresh, but uh, the, uh, so th the food is really quite good. You get to taste whatever you want before the mission and kind of order what you want to have on the mission. And it does taste, it does taste really good, and, and that works out well. Now, the drinks, we are usually just like dehydrated, so we just add the water to, to the flavoring. And now, it's kind of like some of the drinks the kids use with the straws. I don't know if you have those here. And the problem is you can't have just a straw st sticking around because if you hit it, you know, all the water's going to go, all, or, or the liquid's going to go all over the space station, uh, the space shuttle. So we have a little valve on the top that closes it. So you have to get in the habit of drinking something out of the straw, closing the valve, and then Velcroing it to the wall or something like that. And so you kind of just have to get used to that routine, and you, and you get used to it after a little bit. The, the usage of uh, zero gravity terminology uh, is it 100% uh, correct, knowing the fact that uh, the, gra the gravity in the moon is one sixth of the, uh, right. gra the Earth gravity? You're exactly right. It's not zero gravity. Even when we say zero gravity or microgravity, it's not zero gravity. Well, we're, in, we're in free fall. Okay, if, if, we were to ta if we were on the Earth and took an elevator up to the space station without it being in orbit, and we stepped off, we'd fall right to Earth just like we do now, and we, we'd have almost the same amount of gravity. What causes us to have microgravity is the fact that when you're in orbit, you're falling at the same rate as you're going around the Earth, so it feels like you're in zero gravity. But you're absolutely right. If we, were, if we had an elevator and, and went straight up to the space station without any velocity, if we stepped off, we'd fall right back down to Earth. I want to uh, uh, introduce myself a little bit, uh, Jim Riley. I now work. Uh, I'm a former astronaut uh, in that I've left the program. Rex is still there, uh, so he may have the opportunity to fly again on the International Space Station. Uh, I currently work for a university uh, back in uh, Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado, uh, where we have everything online. So all of our classes, the uh, same ones that you'd be taking here in the classroom, we have. Uh, we've built those things so that they're all online, and that's what I've been doing for the last four years. In addition, uh, also. Uh, teach for the U.S. Air Force, uh, teach space uh, uh, operations, uh, how to fly in space, uh, what it is like to operate satellites, uh, and we're getting very involved in uh, microsatellites, uh, which uh, I know you have here in your program, uh, looking at uh, doing some CubeSat experiments. Uh, we do exactly the same thing. In fact, uh, I also work with the uh, Air Force Academy, uh, where they're building their own satellites. They currently have two on orbit, uh, and they're, they have a third one that's being manufactured right now that they're going to launch. But what I wanted to do is talk a little bit more about the future. What's out in front of us? Um, what are the things that, that you, you've seen us doing in the past? Uh, what Rex gave you a great presentation on was what I was able and lucky enough to do as well uh, on three missions. Uh, he actually has a little bit more time, a little bit more spacewalk time than I do. We have the same amount of spacewalks and number, uh, same number. So I have five of them, same as he did. But uh, my background is uh, geosciences. So one of the things that we do when we're not flying in space, we're training to fly in space, is we work on other projects. Uh, one of the projects that I was working on uh, as an astronaut and still work on with NASA to some extent is what are we going to do in the future? Where are we going? Uh, what kinds of things are we going to have to train people to do? What are we going to be looking for when we get there, for example? When we go back to the moon, what are we going to try to see? Uh, we eventually get to Mars. What are we going to be looking at there? Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that uh, here today and then uh, give you a little flavor for what the future might be like. Uh, some of the projects that you may very well be involved in uh, in, your, in your future programs and your careers. Uh, maybe some of the stuff that we talk about here. This first uh, first image that you see here is uh, obviously a, a drawing, uh, but this is what what Mars may have looked like about three billion five hundred million years ago, about the time that life appears to have uh, started here on the surface of the Earth. We're getting a lot of information from our robotic systems on the surface of Mars that suggests that there was a significant amount of water there on the surface during that period. Uh, so life may have very well started there just like it did here. Uh, it was an entirely different environment. There was a lot more water across the surface than obviously you see here now. And in the foreground, what you see are some volcanic seeps that are around, you usually find some uh, hydrothermal seeps somewhere in the vicinity of active volcanism. And in the background, you see a representation of the biggest volcano uh, in the solar system, and that's Olympus Mons, which is over 20,000 meters in height. Uh, twice the height of Mount Everest, 
uh, and that thing was very extremely active uh, during this period. Uh, and we feel, or we think, that there may have very well been uh, quite a number of seeps around the base of the, the volcano, based on some of the some of the flow features. Those features where our water obviously flowed through, but doesn't exist today. And so those are the things that we were looking at that here. Now, of course, when you start any of these presentations, you have to you have to put the audience in the big picture. So here's the really big picture, and you are right about here. We're kind of an ordinary planet on the edge of our galaxy. Uh, anybody recognize this one? Uh, it's not the Milky Way. Uh, we, we don't have a way to photograph our own galaxy because we haven't gotten outside of our, we've just barely gotten outside of our solar system. Uh, anybody got any idea which one this is? Andromeda. Andromeda, exactly. Um, you know, of course, as you're, I'm sure, aware, there's a long history of Arab, uh, Arab um, Arab activities in astronomy, uh, which laid the foundation for a guy you may have heard of who was looking at this particular galaxy back in the 1920s. The guy's name was Edwin Hubble, uh, for which we named the telescope after. Uh, Edwin Hubble was trying to determine whether this was another galaxy, truly a different neighborhood of stars, or whether it was just a cluster of stars within what they thought was a fairly could be a fairly small universe. Well, he was the first one to locate what was called a Cepheid variable star, one that, that, that blinks with an intrinsic brightness. So, of course, uh, one over R squared relationship, the farther away you are, the dimmer it is. Uh, so he was looking at it and recognized that the Cepheid variable stars that he saw up in the upper left-hand part of that image were very, very faint, indicating that this was indeed very, very far away. And that was the first indication that he had that he had seen a separate galaxy. Uh, and as he looked at it, he noticed that the light looked a little bit funny. It was shifted from where it should have been in its spectral lines. And what he noticed with Andromeda was that they were shifted toward the blue, indicating from the Doppler that it's coming towards us. But then when they started looking at everything else, and you can see two globular clusters out here, one at the top and one underneath Andromeda, uh, they were going away. They were shifted to the red. Well, then they started looking around and noticing that, well, everything was pretty much shifted to the red with the exception of this one galaxy. Uh, the Milky Way and Andromeda are, are ben eventually going to merge and become one big galaxy during a galactic collision. Uh, somewhere about 10 billion years or so from now, we'll be long gone by that point. Uh, so we'll miss all the excitement. Uh, but they're going to merge, but everything else was expanding. And that was the beginning of the Big Bang. Now, why do I bring that up in so much detail? Is That's one person's lifetime from 1920 to now. People that were born in that age, some of them are still alive. And so when you think about science, it has gone very, very fast in just a very short period of time. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, when we talk to audiences around the world, they try to figure, try to explain why do we explore space. And really, it's really to try to answer three basic questions. What are we in relation to the universe? And what are we and where are we in relation to the universe? This is a, what was called a deep field image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, and it was a, a, a focus, they focused on a very dark part of the sky where we didn't see anything from the ground. Uh, and they looked at this and left it uh, staring at this bit of the sky, which is very, very small. It would be like if you were to hold a, a coin out at the end of your hand and take the smallest feature on that coin that you can see. That's the area that they were focused on with the Hubble Space Telescope out in the sky to take this image. And all those spots that you can see there are galaxies that they hadn't seen before. So there's over a thousand galaxies that have never been seen. And what's even more interesting is when you look in the middle of that, these galaxies are, that are near the center, that are the faintest on there, are about 12.8 billion years old, 12 billion 800 million years old, which is about 85% of the way back to the beginning of the universe, which is thought to be somewhere around 13.2 to 13.6 billion years old, based on, on some of the estimates. So we're looking at very, very, very old galaxies here. We're looking back in time, literally, to see what the galactic world looked like shortly after the Big Bang. And where did we come from? Well, how did our star get to be the way it was? Well, looking at this particular feature, this, this accretionary cloud, there's if you look at it, you'll notice that there's three bright spots. Those are three brand new stars. And when you look at the, the orientation, 
Well, if we look backwards about 4.6 billion years to when our star was formed, we get a picture that's fairly similar to what you see right there. And what's important about that is that those nearby stars, as they coalesce, as they accrete, they, they are unstable. And as they continue to accrete, this un instability will generate literally massive explosions on some of the stars at different times. And that tends to sweep gas away from the, from the other nearby stars which appeared to be what happened with our star. Otherwise, it would have been a lot bigger. Water wouldn't have formed here in, in all three phases that we know as gas, liquid, and ice. Uh, and we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have had life form here on the surface of the Earth. This would never have happened if, if that had not happened uh, in the past. So we've got, by looking at the stars and looking backwards and forwards in time a little bit, we can get an idea of what's going on here. Where are we going? Well, in about 4.6 billion years, we're only about halfway through the fuel in our sun, but when we do run out of fuel, it's going to do one of two things. It's going to do what Eta Carinae is doing here, potentially, and that is collapse and explode and throw material out into the cosmos. Uh, why is that important? Well, lots of stars had to do this before we could ever be here because the basic building blocks of the universe, as you're probably well aware, are hydrogen and helium, uh, and you have to have fusion occurring in these other stars before we get anywhere close to the carbons that you and I are made of. Uh, certainly the heavier elements, the steels and the iron and everything else that form the steels that we use around us, all the uh, silicon, all the other products that, that we're used to on, in that uh, atomic uh, scale, we're all built inside these, these furnaces that were the stars that preceded us. And all of these had to have, have gone through their lives and exploded before we could we could become who we are. Now I mentioned science is moving very fast, and I tried to figure out how to explain that. Uh, and this is just looking at the last four centuries. So we're looking back to 1600, and as you can notice here, you notice there's a picture of a guy on a horse and then a train. That's about as fast as we could go for about 250 years. It was somewhere around 60 to 70 kilometers an hour tops, and that was at the very end when the trains were coming into play. Then starting in the 20th century, we had our first airplane flight with the Wright brothers who, who as uh, one uh, observer of the time put it, flew through the smoke screen of impossibility and uh, lifted off with a heavier than air aircraft, which uh, just less than 100 years later became what uh, Rex and I flew into space, became the space shuttle. And we went from doing you know, somewhere around 50 miles an hour, or somewhere around 70 kilometers an hour, doing 25,000 kilometers an hour uh, fairly routinely in less than less than 80 years. And that was, again, the space of one human lifetime uh, that that transportation system worked, uh, was built for us. Now, of course, that was our, our century, the 20th century for me and Rex. This next one, of course, belongs to the students that are in the university now. The 21st century is yours. Uh, and it's going to be moving at least as fast, if not faster. And you're going to be the architects of that future, you know, designing how fast things are going to move and where things are going to go. Now, we've also got uh, the beginnings of, of a commercial space industry, which is part of what we were talking about this week. In 1961, we launched Al Shepard into the first ballistic trajectory. About uh, 45 years later, we had the first ballistic trajectory where Spaceship One did exactly the same type of flight but it was a commercial entity. Uh, and now, uh, it may very well be within the next decade, you and I are going to buy a ticket instead of taking that 14-hour flight from, from Riyadh back to Colorado, uh, which I'm going to be doing next week. Uh, hopefully, we can do that in somewhere around four hours, which I would gladly pay that ticket right now rather than spend that 14 hours. So... Let's take a look again. Let's, let's move out into the future. Let's bring it a little bit closer back to home. We've looked around the galaxy a little bit. Let's take a look at what we're doing uh, on the Earth. Uh, and we're going to take this and use this extension. All this history that Rex and I were part of now builds our capability. It's the capability now to take us back to the moon where we don't go just to set footsteps in the surface of the moon in sort of the heroic age of exploration. What we want to do is go back and set up uh, permanent research stations, very similar to how we did things in the Antarctic. In 1910, the first explorers went just to see if they could get there, survive, and come home. Some didn't, as you know. Uh, and then 50 years later, we had a permanent research station there where people were going down, spending their time working on their, their graduate studies uh, and postgraduate studies. And now we've had a continuous human presence on the surface of Antarctica ever since. Well, we want to do exactly the same thing now that we've completed the International Space Station. 
And that's to take us back to the moon and eventually on to Mars. But why do we care? Well, if you want to look at the surface of the Earth right now and look at, at how much of the surface uh, belongs to what age, uh, how much of the surface can we see back in time? That's what that line that you see right there. Down at the bottom you see 4.6 billion years on the left all the way to the present day. And that line, as you see it increase, is just the relative abundance of the rock, the age of the rock. And as you can see, almost everything we see around us, uh, especially here in Saudi Arabia, is from 2 billion years and younger. We don't really see anything, not very little, to the left, really out there at the other end. The green line that you see across there, which is labeled the lifeline, is where we have a good fossil record. We can see life going back to, to about 3 billion years, about 3.1. Uh, but we really can't see back to that 3.6 billion years or so where we think life really took off here on the surface of the Earth. And we just don't have a good record because it's all been destroyed. All that rock's been reworked. The moon, on the other hand, uh, the oldest rocks on the surface of the Earth are about the same age as the youngest rocks on the surface of the moon. The Apollo uh, astronauts, we had 12 folks that stood on the surface of the moon and collected samples from six different spots. Uh, and if you can imagine trying to figure out the geology of Saudi Arabia by landing in just six places in Saudi Arabia and try to figure out what's going on in the entire country here, you can imagine just how difficult it would be to try to figure out what's going on on Mars. In fact, it's even more difficult because you can't land on the west side of Saudi Arabia where all the mountains are. It's too rough. You're only going to be able to land in the smooth parts, which are like out here. So now you can get just little, little snapshots of what's going on. Well, we want to go back to the moon and start taking a look at some of the other parts out there. Well, the only way to do that is to go and stay. Instead of staying on the surface for three to four days, we want to go back and stay for three to four months at a time. Uh, starting with the first mission, so it would be down for two to three weeks at a time, building, essentially, an international space station on the surface of the moon. That would be the plan that we want to do. So that we can start uh, examining these really old rocks that are significantly different in their chemistry from what we see here on the surface of the Earth. Why? We don't know. Uh, so that's one of the questions we want to find out. Is something happening over time that we just don't know about here on the surface of the Earth? Don't know that yet. Mars, on the other hand, has this interesting history. It goes all the way back to about 4.6 billion years on the surface as well, but it also has this big pulse right there in the center, which is the gap, which covers that lifeline where we don't have a good fossil record and may give us an idea of what's going on on the surface of Mars where we might have seen life exist in the, in the past. In fact, the northern hemisphere of Mars, based on the rover information that we've had from the two that have been down to Opportunity and Spirit, and from the first indications of the science that we're getting back from, from Curiosity, which just landed, is that there was a lot of water, and not only a lot of water, it apparently stayed there for quite some time, and it was moving. We can see the same kinds of pebbles that you can see here if you go out and look at the rocks around you in, the, in the, 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 the wadis here, you can see these rounded pebbles. And they're rounded because they've been washed down the, the stream vents and have been rounded off. We've seen the same thing in one of the Curiosity images that we saw this, this week that shows us something was really going on on the surface of Mars, and we want to know what's going on. So on Earth's lifeline, we see everything happening here, but we can't get back to the earliest stuff you see on the left. All of the life that we see, um, the, the stuff that is well studied, is in the last 600 million years, which is a very small part of the left-hand side, which is the whole life of the Earth down to 4.6. And so we can't see any of that stuff really below that point in terms of what life looked like. And we can't see back to the beginning. All of the things that you and I are familiar with, all the, all the different families of organisms, all came from the, the progenitor, the beginning. Uh, and that's termed the tree of life. What did it look like? What did this first form of life look like? We have no idea. Uh, because it's just not here. But it may very well exist on the surface of Mars, and that's what we want to do. So next up for us, and next phase of exploration, is, as we, we talked about, would be to go back to the moon, and instead of spending three to four days on the surface and then coming home with a few hundred pounds of rocks at a time, we actually go to the surface of the moon, stay there, do the analysis on the rocks there on the surface, and then just send the information back to the folks here on Earth. And we'll be doing that with a robotic system with the human system uh, so that you can maximize the amount of, of area that you can cover and maximize the amount of stay that you can do. 
Uh, the idea was to put all this together in low Earth orbit, the same way we did the International Space Station, but now you put engines on it and fly it, uh, fly it to the moon. That's a very efficient way of doing it. It's a very cost-effective way of doing it as well. The idea was to put these things on the surface, and after the first half a dozen missions or so, you've now formed the basic foundation or the structure of what would be your permanent research station on the surface uh, when you get there. Now, this little uh, video, which I hope runs, one of the things as engineers that we have to deal with, and, and Rex can attest to this as well, is you have to think about how the human fits into this mechanical system that you're going to build around them. And when you do that, you have to think about all the things that we do, all the things that we need. But one of the things you also have to do is you have to think a little bit about what are all the things that, that we can do wrong as part of this as well. And hopefully this will run, because it's not looking like it's doing it yet. It favors. So what's going to happen in this video is as this guy starts down the ladder, he's going to turn around and look just as the door slams shut. And then he's going to realize he doesn't have his keys to the door. <laughs> so he's going to be searching around. And it's a great example of human engineering. You know, we have to think of not only what we do right, but all the things that we can do wrong as part of the process as well. So we're, we're constantly having to, to think about that. You don't think about that a lot of times when you're designing your aircraft, your space systems, the International Space Station, the computers that we use on the International all of that stuff. You have to think about that as well. But let's go to Mars. Uh, we've never been there with a human, obviously. We've got robotic systems, though, that are telling us an awful lot of information about the surface of Mars. But they can only tell us what we tell them to look for. And it can adapt to some degree, but you and I have the most amazing computer sitting between our ears uh, that's available. It's the best exploration tool there is. Uh, we have the ability to do what we, what's called adaptive reasoning. You can take a look at something that doesn't make sense and you can start piecing together a story and then you test the story against what you see until you finally drive to a hypothesis which becomes a theory and then once you get enough observational information it becomes a fact. Uh, we can do that in our heads and we can do it amazingly fast. You're testing stuff constantly as you're walking on the surface of, of Mars. Now, does Mars have water? Well, we've, we've found that there is indeed water. We knew that there was at least a little bit of water on the surface, or in the atmosphere of Mars, because we could see these water ice clouds uh, during the wintertime, uh, indicating that there was a very, very low humidity. In fact, it's so low that it's, it's significantly lower than the driest day in Riyadh uh, that is the wettest day on the surface of Mars. That's how low the humidity is on average. But the water does exist in the surface, or has in the past, because we see these flow features that you see right here. It looks like water has flowed around these craters, and it looked like it was a fairly extensive flow at some point. In addition, the Phoenix Lander, if you look in the, closely in that upper left image, you'll see these white spots that are there. Uh, and in the right-hand image, the trench that exposed those white spots now no longer has those white spots four Mars days after they were exposed. Uh, what that indicates is that there was indeed water ice just a few centimeters below the surface, uh, indicating there's a significant amount of water, free water in the form of ice, in the soils of Mars. What does that mean? Well, if, if life can find water and a means of nutrition, it'll colonize it. We've seen that here. In fact, it's everywhere. Life is everywhere. Even in places that looks like it doesn't exist, it's there. Uh, and it's, it could very well be there as well. Now we've had these rovers that were designed to only last 90 days, have been operating for 60 months, and the, one of them is, is dead. The last one is getting near the end of its life, but we've got a brand new one up there, Curiosity, which is going to start looking for those signs of active life on the surface. They're going to start looking for the organic molecules uh, that would be associated with life uh, that these uh, rovers here could not do. Uh, these can give us some idea of what's going on with the rocks, one of the first things we saw when we landed the rovers was there's two things in those images. You can see the layers, which, just like the layers in the rock here, would suggest that they've been laid down in a water environment. The other thing is you see those little, what look like little marbles or BBs that are sitting on the surface in that upper image on the right side. That one on the lower right side is an image from Arizona, and it's an identical feature. And it's a form of iron oxide called hematite, that only forms in the, in the presence of water here on Earth. We assume that the same thing happens on Mars, another piece indicating that there's water on the surface or has been. 
We also have a piece of Mars, which you probably know a little bit about. Uh, Alan Hill's meteorite that was picked up in Antarctica uh, has been studied extensively there at Johnson Space Center. And it, that red curve that I had earlier, that's where a lot of this information came from. Uh, we know that the rock formed 4.5 billion years ago based on looking at isotopes within it. Uh, and 3.6 3 billion years ago, about the time life started, uh, there was a lot of impacts from meteors, meteorites that were hitting the surface of Mars, fractured this rock, water per appears to have percolated down into the rock based on the minerals that we can see in it, and in addition to that, we see this thing down on the lower left, which is a very, very small feature, but it's a segmented feature. It looks very much like a nanobacteria here on, the, on Earth. But it turns out that, we, that uh, a number of people thought it was too small to be life. Uh, because we haven't seen anything like that here on, on Earth. Well, we found out that we haven't found anything that small here on Earth because we haven't looked. Uh, since that time, we've had a number of investigators who have gone and looked for very, very small forms of life, and we've seen exactly that at, that, at those scales here on Earth. Down deep in rock, about a mile deep in the, in the subsurface, but we're finding things that look just like it. The other thing that you can see in this SEM photo right there is that that kind of knobbly looking texture that's around that segmented worm-like structure, uh, that's, that's a form of uh, limestone, very similar to what you see out here in the rocks right outside of, of, this, of the town. Uh, that limestone uh, is formed almost exclusively in the presence of water. Again, one more piece of information. And then what's even more interesting is those two bright things that are in that image are iron sulfides, uh, pyrite. Iron sulfide primarily forms in the presence of organic material where there's not enough oxygen, and so it forms an iron sulfide composition as well. So there you have it. That's a quick story. Are we running out of time? Okay. Okay, let me, uh, let me touch on two things here, and then we'll roll into some questions. Uh, one of the things that we looked at as well with the rovers, I just wanted to show you this, this chart right here is when we looked at the salts, and that's just looking at the chlorine and the bromine, uh, you'll notice that there's a bunch of green squares, and then there's two uh, blue triangles there, and then there's the meteorites, which are down here in the lower red. But you'll notice that up that upper uh, blue triangle there is, is seawater concentrations, the same concentration you get if you walked out to the gulf out here and picked up some of the water and analyzed it. That's what we see right there. You'll notice that all those green triangles, which are from those rovers that are on the surface of Mars, we got the same concentration. So that would indicate that that water was not only there, but it was there for a long period of time. So that's why we want to go back and look at, at, at uh, Mars. And uh, the rest of this was, I was looking at uh, how do you define life, which is an interesting question. It's actually very difficult. It's kind of like art. It's, you know it when you see it. Uh, so we had some characteristics of how we want to do that. And a question, does it require photosynthesis? Maybe not. And does it have to be carbon-based? Uh, maybe not. Uh, we're also seeing methane's on the surface of Mars, which you see right here, uh, very, very low concentrations, but methane is formed in the presence of life here on the surface of the Earth. So we could be saying something there. Life exists, as we mentioned, anywhere it can find water and nutrition, and it can live on just about anything. And so it may have been a very wet and warm Mars in the past, and we want to send folks back on a three-year mission to go back and start looking at this in detail, put those first footsteps on the surface of Mars, it will be an international program. It'll be just like the International Space Station program. And uh, with any luck at all, uh, maybe uh, one, of, one of you will be a Saudi Arabian astronaut on one of these missions. Uh, if so, we'd love to have you. So with that, I wanted to close it up and uh, give you an opportunity to ask a few questions at this point. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Thank you, Mr. Malham. We appreciate you sharing with us your wonderful experience and this real opportunity for our students to get to ask real astronauts on real stuff that they see only in books. And most uh, prominently, thank you for bringing life and emotions into uh, space flight. So we get to know what, how do real astronauts feel and what do, what do they have in mind. We just tend to read these in books. So we are running out of time, so I appreciate if we have, uh, we can. I can do just a few questions, so if you can ask uh, questions. Uh, 
Well, uh, thank you for your uh, nice presentation. And I have one question, actually. As I understand, the, uh, the Atlantics uh, made the last uh, space uh, mission, right? So the, there is no more uh, space shuttle mission. So what is the uh, uh, NASA plan for uh, uh, next space, uh, manned space uh, uh, mission? NASA has, uh, NASA has a, basically a two-pronged plan. Uh, the first one is uh, we've been flying in low Earth orbit for a very long time now. Uh, and uh, the commercial sector, uh, the companies that can build the spacecraft, uh, for example, SpaceX with their Dragon, there's a number of others that are in the process of building their own spacecraft, uh, are uh, looking at, at becoming the, the companies that will provide that capability to get humans to low Earth orbit. So we're looking for that. Uh, now, to go from here to the moon and onto Mars, which is what NASA is really charged with doing, it's to push the frontiers of our knowledge uh, out. Uh, we're going to be building a new spacecraft uh, that is a combination of crew, new crew vehicle, which is uh, the Orion uh, vehicle. But I think you've worked on that. Both of us have worked on that particular system uh, in the past. And you still work on it? And, and uh, Rex is working on it currently. Uh, and that's designed to carry, uh, originally we designed to carry at least seven people to the International Space Station, but more importantly, it was built modularly so that we could fly four people to the surface of the moon uh, and ultimately uh, build a build out the system so we could fly it onto Mars at the point that we, we choose to do that. So that's our plan is to, uh, since the shuttle's been retired, uh, we're currently flying with the Russians on the Soyuz, as you know. Uh, and then uh, in the future, we hope that we will have uh, commercial companies that are providing contract services, very much like early aviation activities in the 1920s, uh, providing contract services to the government. Uh, we anticipate doing something very similar, uh, which will ultimately lead to you and I getting on a, on a spacecraft with uh, Saudi Airlines written on the side of it and taking that four-hour trip from here to Denver rather than the 14-hour trip that I'm going to see next week. So so that's that's the basic. Okay. Yeah, very quick question on his behalf. He's a nice and great student. Okay. Uh, he's asking, did you plan to be in space, to go to the space while you were doing your schooling? And when really was the first time okay, it came to in the table to this to, to have it on your uh, in your plan for being somewhere somewhere in there in the on the space shuttle? I will take care of the translation to him. Okay, okay. Um, I'll answer briefly for myself, and then then Rex can uh, add his piece as well, which is probably better than mine. Um, I when I was eight years old, John Glenn was flying in space. And uh, I was asked by a dentist if I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, and of course, I was sitting in the dentist chair with all that stuff in my mouth. And I was thinking, anywhere but here, but it stuck. And uh, that was my dream growing up. I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, and so I never gave up on that dream, even though I kind of went around the hard way. Uh, I became a geologist when, uh, when I wasn't going to be a fighter pilot, test pilot, astronaut, which is how you got there back in the 1970s. So I became a geologist, uh, worked in the petroleum industry. In fact, uh, one of the things that I did just before I got a uh, request from NASA to come in and interview was I started talking to Saudi Aramco about coming over here to work for a few years. Uh, but NASA called, and so I went to work for them instead uh, and spent got my space flights. But uh, I grew up being one of those kids that always dreamed of it, uh, but my only secret to success was that I never gave up on my dream. I kept pushing for it, even though I was getting older and I was an adult. I never gave up and continued applying. Applied for eight years in a row, and then they finally gave me a call to come in. And uh, then I was really surprised when I was brought in and had the opportunity to work with folks like Rex and all the other great people there at, uh, at NASA. Yeah, I was somewhat similar. I, when I was when I was your age, I dreamed of flying. I read books his age, yes, and I I dreamed of, uh, of flying in space, and I read books about space, and I thought it was really interesting. But I didn't take it too seriously until I was older, and I was starting to get some of the experience that uh, that I needed to to to, to be a com competitive to apply for astronaut. And uh, like Jim said, something I I took a, a different route also, but I tried hard and kept trying, and then uh, finally got accepted, and it was a it was a, a great reward after all those years of trying. 
Okay, this will be the last question, I believe, and after which we'll close the floor for any more questions. Actually, since eight is there is no much progress in any. You know, we we have seen same same uh, rock, same space, uh, airspace. We have seen same, and actually, when we were kids, we 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 we, we dream to. To, to have this I mean, th 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 this experience will be available for for everyone uh, why progress progress and slowly become many more sl uh, slower in the, in the in the two last decades thank you uh, yeah why has it become slower the progress in the last two decades there's there's an interesting relationship that uh, that when you start into these different phases of exploration, there's the first one where you put your first footsteps there. That's the heroic one. And then you go into a research phase. Uh, research is uh, a lot slower paced. It's more more methodical. And so when we, when we entered the research phase for low Earth orbit, we started building the International Space Station uh, beginning uh, at the end of the, the 1990s. Uh, and when we did that, uh, it, it looked slower. Well. Rex and I can tell you it wasn't slow. There was a lot going on, uh, but it's not—it's not, it's not uh, what we would call uh, sexy in the United States. It's not something that the news media is going to get a hold of. You know, they—they just look at it and go, "Oh, that's boring stuff. That's science. It's a laboratory. You know, it's beakers and and uh, and and strange guys in white suits. You know, uh, and that kind of thing." So they were—they didn't. Uh, broadcast that information as much as they had during the earlier heroic phase, which is easier for people to to, to grasp, you know, to be able to understand. Uh, we're turning that around, of course. Uh, once we go back to space and we go back to the moon, there's going to be a lot of interest because it's going to be something new. It's going to be more of the, uh, the, the basic just getting there and doing things until we start building the stations and then that, that interest in the, the media Will drop off. Now, what's been fairly interesting is is we see fairly extensive audience uh, support whenever we go speak, uh, like speaking with you today. Uh, that indicates that it has never really been boring to a lot of people. It's just that it's not necessarily in the public eye as much, uh, which is not a bad thing necessarily. It indicates that we're progressing and moving into those later phases. But for what we need to be doing is. As, as NASA, particularly, NASA and the international space community, is looking, where do we go from here? Um, where do we push out? And where do we go next? What part of the moon do we want to go see? Where do we want to land on Mars when we go put the first humans there? How do we even get humans to Mars? All those questions are things we need to be th thinking about right now in places like right here uh, at your university. So with this wonderful answer, uh, we will conclude our meeting today. Thank you, Dr. Alegi, and thank you, Mr. Rolham, and thank you, everyone, for attending. I appreciate it. I appreciate it.
you know, from what we're doing in the United States, Russia, and China. And we in the United States are working on getting a new vehicle to, to get our people to and from the space station. So uh, NASA is going in two different directions. We're, we're, we're getting a, letting the commercial companies develop the, 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 the way back to the people. Back and forth between the so they're just as still there, right? Yes, the money is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, always the yeah. problem. So their interest is still there, but the money will Scientific contribution. Minister, from pure economic point of view, are they paying back to the states, to the United States, uh, okay. in the whole, the whole research? Absolutely. There have been several studies that have been conducted that have a very range of them. The when you look at we're proud of uh, producing from catalysts to refine heavy oil to produce lighter products. Oh, right. And this is now a technology that is being licensed to all refiners worldwide. Okay. We did it with our colleagues in Saudi Aramco and Nippon Oil Company in uh, Japan. Oh. So yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Just go over, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. One, two. Smile, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice meeting you. Thank 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 you.